Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to our third revolutionizing healthcare session and our final session for 2020. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I'll be moderating today's session and I handle the Van der Schaar Labs communications. We'll also be joined by Mihaila Van der Schaar, who will be giving presentations and handling the Q&A session and supported by Alex Chan, who will be co-moderating and who is one of our PhD students at our lab. So to give you an idea of what to expect from this session, um, many of you will hopefully remember that in our, our previous session, we introduced a framework for unifying um, machine learning for healthcare via a number of methods, techniques, and structures. And in this session, we hope to build on this by showing how various clinical problems and questions can be defined and understood through formalisms, and also to explain how this must happen before we actually attempt to solve these problems. And we'll be doing this through the focus or through, through the lens of acute care. And in support of this, uh, we've conducted a number of interviews with uh, clinicians and um, on, on the intensive care setting, and they've raised the questions and problems that you'll see in this session today. So uh, to break this down kind of time-wise, um, we'll start with a brief introduction by Mihaila, who will be explaining what we mean by formalisms and why these are necessary. Uh, we'll also be going into a number of the acute care problems and questions raised by the clinicians we spoke to. And Mihaila will explain how we can apply formalisms uh, in addressing these and linking them to solutions in AI, ML, and operations research. I will then introduce the Hub for Healthcare, which is a new project run by our lab, uh, which kind of tries to tie a lot of this together through our website. And then we'll go into a relatively short Q&A and discussion session, kind of covering a lot of the topics um, in, this, uh, on, in these presentations and videos. And the reason we don't have a lot of time for the Q&A session in this case is because we're taking a lot of the structure we introduced this time and carrying it forward to future sessions. And hopefully we'll have more time for Q&A and discussion in subsequent sessions. So if you do have any questions for us, uh, please do post them into the Zoom chat, uh, preferably during the presentations and videos. Uh, the earlier, the better so that we can get to these and actually uh, address them in the Q&A session itself. Uh, we would like to ensure that the questions that we take are from practicing clinicians, if at all possible, because you are our target audience for these sessions. And then when this is done, um, probably after just about an hour, we will wrap up and I'll explain what you can expect from revolutionizing healthcare going forward. But for now, um, please let me introduce Mihaila's introduction to formalisms and explanation of why they're necessary. Hello. And welcome again to our engagement session with clinicians, revolutionizing healthcare. I am Mihaila van der Schaar, and I would like to thank you very much for making time to engage with us. Since we last met, yet again, machine learning and artificial intelligence have been in the news. You will have seen Google DeepMind's AlphaFold, a really impressive technology that has solved a long standing and complex problem, the protein folding problem, which was formalized but remain unsolved for 50 years. Let us reflect on what has been achieved here. What Google DeepMind has done is take an existing, well-formalized and understood problem and then use deep learning technology to address this task. In contrast, the problems that we face in clinical medicine are ones that have not been formalized into rigorous problem formalisms, which can then be addressed by systematic solutions. The big challenge is to take the hard questions that you have as clinicians and create rigorous problem definitions and formalisms. This is hard and challenging, and why problems in medicine remain unformalized and unsolved for hundreds of years. What my group specializes in is taking complex problems such as those you need to solve in medicine and express them as rigorous mathematical formalisms. It is only once we have done this that we can solve them using technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and operations research. Healthcare has plenty of complex and difficult problems. Many of these are apparent to you as clinicians, as the challenges you face every day in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of patients. As a medical professional, you are trained in how to describe them to each other in descriptive terms that are suitable for the profession. But this approach is not rigorous formalism. One of the main aims of our revolutionizing healthcare engagement is to work closely with you as clinicians 
to understand these problems and create formalisms for which methods such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and operations research can provide solutions. The intent here is to help move medicine from art to science. Today, we started this process together. We will begin with one area of medicine, acute care, and discuss several medical problems and associated examples provided by a few clinicians working in acute care. Then we will discuss formalisms and methods by which they can be solved and iterate together as a group. In medicine, there are many concepts such as acute or chronic to describe the type of pathology or phase of a clinical condition, mild, moderate, and severe to capture the severity of an illness. They have worked well for conveying information between professionals and they allow clinical conditions to be distinguished and categorized. However, they are based on opinion and tacit agreement between you all that you acquire during your professional training. For a rigorous formalism, we need to find ways to define and capture concepts formally so we can lose uncertainty or ambiguity, or at least recognize and formalize even uncertainty and ambiguity. So let me challenge you. Can you all agree in every case to know exactly when a condition turns from acute to chronic? Or let us take a more complex but common scenario. You go and see a patient in the ward, clinic or emergency room. You gather symptoms and context from the clinical condition, elicit physical sign on examination and order some tests. Based on the interpretation of what you learn from this and your expertise, you create a list of differential diagnoses with a varying degree of likelihood. And on the basis of this, make decisions. This has to the test of time in medicine, but it is an art, not a science. With rigorous formalism, we would capture each of these pieces of information for a patient in a way that is systematic, quantifiable, and universally agreed. This is the challenge we aim to solve together in our revolutionizing healthcare engagement. As I said, we will start first with a few acute care clinicians discussing some key challenges they face. I will then formalize these problems and talk about possible solutions to address them. Subsequently, Nick will show you a demonstration of our Hub for Healthcare website, which matches the complex problems of medicine raised by clinicians to the formalism and solutions I have suggested so far and which need your feedback. This hub is intended to start a dialogue with you, the clinical community, about suitable formalisms and solutions, as well as provide a support resource for you. It is also a resource for my community, the artificial intelligence, machine learning and operations research community to bridge the gap between our communities and help many of us who struggle to convert the narratives of medicine into rigorous formalisms that can be solved. So let us begin. Hello. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, before this session, we had a number of interviews with acute care clinicians um, who kindly volunteered their time under uh, exceptionally stressful circumstances at the moment. Um, so please uh, let me introduce the clinicians we spoke to, some of whose questions are featured later on in the presentation. So I'm, uh, I'm Maxime Kennison. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at UCLA. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Vishnu Chandrabalan. I'm a consultant surgeon at uh, Preston in Lancashire, Northwest England. I am also the clinical lead for data science uh, at my NHS Trust. I've been a surgeon for 20 years. So I'm Tom Daniels. Uh, I'm an adult respiratory physician at the University Hospital of Southampton. And uh, I mostly look after adults with cystic fibrosis, but I have an interest in machine learning and its application to uh, acute hospital healthcare. Hi, my name is Paul Elbers. I'm an intensivist at Amsterdam UMC, and I am chairing the Laboratory for Critical Care Computational Intelligence. My name is Dr. Ari Eckler. I'm a consultant in intensive care medicine at Cambridge in the UK. I'm Brent Urshoff. I'm an anesthesiologist at the University of California, Los Angeles. My subspecialty is in anesthesiology for liver transplantation. 
So my name is Lucas Florin. I'm a resident in uh, the intensive care unit and I'm a PhD student in machine learning in um, the intensive care unit. So my name is Steve Harris. I'm a critical care physician at University College Hospital um, and uh, a clinician uh, on a data science group here as well. My name is James Ray. Um, I'm an emergency medicine consultant in uh, Oxford and I'm also uh, a clinical advisor, a national clinical advisor for NHS England on the programme called 111 First. Um, and I used to be a clinical advisor for NHS X um, in digital urgent and emergency care. So I'm, uh, I'm... Okay, so in this session, we're gonna feature a number of the problems and questions on the acute care setting raised by the clinicians you just saw. Um, all of the clinicians do have features that are actually uh, problems or questions that are actually featured on our lab's website, as I'll explain later on in a few minutes, but for the purposes of this session, we selected just a few. I think the problem that I see is the uh, potential biggest win for hospital inpatients is that of revolutionising the early warning score system. In the UK, we use the National Early Warning Score version two, uh, which has been around 10, 10 or more years in one, one guise or another. And uh, my experience of it is that it's a very blunt tool. Uh, it only looks at uh, data from a single time point doesn't include uh, any pathology data or demographics uh, and doesn't learn over time either. Um, and machine learning uh, has the potential to incorporate uh, all that digital data that we've got access to as clinicians in hospital, uh, pathology data, um, medications, previous medical history, uh, even um, radiology as well. And uh, it takes a long time for a clinician to trawl through all of that. And it's very difficult to pick out patterns and detect patients who are deteriorating, perhaps even before they're reviewed by, uh, by clinicians. And I think uh, early warning schools have got, um, have made a big impact uh, in healthcare over the last 10 years, and they've certainly improved things, but it's time to take that to the next level uh, by incorporating much more data in a way that uh, no human can quite manage. So that's the problem I'd like to see fixed. And one of the questions that I would have as a doctor is if we have a patient that is mechanically ventilated, given their course of mechanical ve ventilation and the state that they're in and all the vital signs and lab values that we have available, can we predict which patients could be safely extubated? Or rather, as a second question, can we predict what patients would benefit from an extra day of mechanical ventilation and how would their chances of successful extubation change over the course of one more day? Now, my question to the community is about antibiotic dosing. Getting the right dose to the right patient at the right time is very important and may save lives. We currently use classical pharmacokinetic models to guide our dosing strategy. But as a clinician, I always have the feeling that there are very limited covariates that are being considered in those models. I think there's much more information to be leveraged from the routinely collected data, which is very high in quantity in intensive care medicine, to better inform those models. So maybe we can ask the community to develop newer machine learning techniques models for this specific purpose. And that would be of great benefit to the treatment of future critically ill patients. What's the additional predictive benefit to be gained from keeping a particular patient at high risk of readmission in the ICU for another day of monitoring? Because if this predictive gain is small, then it may be more resource effective to institute a high level of monitoring on the ward instead for this particular individual. One question that I could pose is in the uh, inpatient setting, it pertains to personalized monitoring. So for every patient, how often should their vital signs be monitored on the floor? And um, what is the, given the vital signs at hand and the other patient comorbidities, should this person be admitted or transferred to a higher level of care? What I would like to see is, what is, is there a way where we can model the, the physiology of an individual patient 
and then look at the physiological burden of a cohort of patients as in measure the aggregate disease severity of a cohort of patients. And then go a step further and model the mismatch between the physiological burden of a cohort of patients and the healthcare resource that is available to treat them. And then I want to take that a step further and then look at how that has an impact on patient flow through various parts of the organization. As an example, if we were to model the physiological burden of the medical assessment unit and the mismatch between the capacity available within the medical assessment unit to treat that patient cohort, how does that, that then have an impact on the patients waiting in ED who are now waiting to move into MAU at a later point in time? So this is a fairly complex problem and this is a very real problem. And how can Mihaela, how can your team help us deal with that? Right, so uh, now Mihaela is going to explain in a presentation how we can actually address these specific uh, problems and questions through the use of formalisms that tie through to solutions in AI, ML, or operations research. Um, this will be about uh, half an hour, and we, we pre-recorded it in order to avoid any risks with uh, internet environment, etc. cetera. Um, again, if you do have any questions, please post them into the Zoom chat, um, especially on this presentation, but also if you want to know about anything else that's covered during this session, um, please do feel free to post them. We have heard from a few acute care clinicians about the challenges they face. For instance, Tom has discussed the need of developing an early warning score system, which is not only considering data from a single time point, but rather is taking into account the wealth of information available about the patient during his or her hospitalization, thereby having the ability to learn over time. This problem can be formalized and solved as a time series analysis and forecasting problem. To formalize and solve the challenge provided by Tom, as well as a few other problems that have been brought forward by other clinicians, I'm going to introduce a general design framework for dynamic forecasting in the hospital. A key ingredient in this formalism will be the development of a disease progression model, which is capable to learn from the observational electronic health tracker data, as well as clinical knowledge. Then at runtime, at decision time, we are going to be able to take into consideration for the patient at hand, the input data that is available so far which is a time series data, which may include clinical findings, lab measurements, vital sign, treatment administered so far, events of interest, as well as the observation times of all of this. And on the basis of this, issue dynamic forecasts. This dynamic forecast may include, but are not limited to determining disease onset, disease severity, disease progression, as well as clinical deterioration. So the goal will be to develop a data-driven, accurate and interpretable dynamic forecasting model that is personalized for the patient at hand and which can empower clinicians by providing risk scores, early warning systems, early diagnosis, prognosis, as well as assist clinicians in their complicated decision-making, which may include triaging, determining what treatment to use or what interventions to do and when. The data that we have at our disposal to learn all of this from is time series data. They may include static data, which is acquired about the patient and admission time, as well as possibly past history of the patient prior to hospitalization. Then, as the patient is hospitalized, a wealth of information is acquired over time. This represents multiple streams of measurements which I have indicated here, as well as many more. These measurements are sparse, irregularly and informatively sampled. Hence, the information is acquired by the doctors only when they deem this information to be necessary. So for instance, a lab test is done on a particular patient or an X-ray is performed only when the clinician thinks this is necessary. So the data is irregularly and informatively sampled. 
Also, the electronic health record of a patient may include multiple events of interest, which may happen to the patient during his hospitalization so far, and may be recorded by the clinicians. It is also important to note that not all clinical states of the patient may be recorded, and they may not always be recorded um, at onset. So for instance, the patient may already be deteriorating for some time when he or she is admitted to the ICU. So we need to be able to learn without having clinical states that are always observed. Also, another challenge is associated with this data is that there are many possible patterns for recovery or deterioration. Patients exhibit heterogeneous phenotypes which may be due to their unique characteristics such as genetic information or possibly different morbidities or comorbidities which they may have. In order to formalize this time series data, we can use a comprehensive notation such that the one I showed here, which contain the longitudinal observation for a particular patient which is the sequence of longitudinal observation until the current time. And the different observations uh, may be this multivariate uh, data and also the time associated with these observations. These covariates are both static as well as time varying. And they are not necessarily measured at regular time intervals, as I mentioned before the data is informatively sampled. Also, we have time to event outcomes, and this may include, for instance, the patient dying, the patient being discharged, or the patient experiencing a particular event of interest. Some of the patients may also be right censored. On the basis of this information, we are now going to issue dynamic forecasts, and this is a challenging problem. What I mean here by dynamic is that the forecasts are not going to be issued at just one time point, for instance, at uh, admission time or after 24 hours after admission. They are going to be issued repeatedly over time as more data is acquired about the patient at hand. So we are going to do dynamic forecasts. These forecasts are going to include the following. We are going to be able to forecast subsequent value of biomarkers of interest. For instance, creatinine levels or blood pressure or a particular lab test. Forecast will also include predicting the projected risk for different events of interest and how this evolves over time, as well as time to event analysis, survival analysis, for instance, what is the probability of the patient being discharged or being admitting to the ICU? We are not only issuing forecasts, but also uncertainty estimates associated with this forecast. And this is important such that the clinicians know when they can trust the forecast made by the machine learning model and when they cannot. On the basis of these various forecasts, we can build individualized bespoke disease atlases for the patient at hand, which can empower clinicians. And this is exactly what we have done uh, in a variety of works uh, in the previous years. Let us discuss what is involved here. So we need to do time series analysis and dynamic forecasting. And for that, we are going to have a few steps involved. First, we need to formalize and build disease progression models that are able to learn from the available data as well as the clinical judgments of clinicians. So we need to build disease progression models that are accurate and representative. Then we will learn the model parameters from the available electronic health tracker data from the data that we have about past patients at training time offline. When we are satisfied with the accuracy of the model, we can start using this model at test time, run time, to issue dynamic forecast for the new patients. We are going to use the data that is available so far for the patient at hand and issue dynamic forecast from him, for him and her or her. 
Also, we are going to be able to unravel in this way new understanding of disease progression that are not only average, one size fits all, population level or subgroup level, but rather are bespoke, personalized, thereby being able to practice bespoke medicine. Let us take a look at possible formalisms for disease progression models, which represent the first step in building such a dynamic forecast. A very common way to model disease progression in the past has been to use state-based models like this one. So you have here a patient progressing uh, across the different stages or states of his or her disease, from healthy to extremely sick. You're also going to see that we have an absorbing state. This state is the, when the patient is dying. The patient can no longer escape this particular state. This is why it's called an absorbing state. We can, it's absorbing, we cannot get out of it. However, for all the other stages, the patient may either improve, thereby moving towards a um, uh, healthier disease state, or may deteriorate, thereby moving to a higher um, level of sickness. And the probabilities of transiting between these different states are what characterizes this model. So when a patient comes to the hospital, may start in a particular disease stage, N minus two, and depending on what is happening to him or her over time, they may progress to a healthier state in which they may be discharged or may deteriorate and die. Such models are known as Markov models. A key characteristics of the Markov models is that the entire history of the patient up till the current time is compacted only in the current state. So to make predictions about future probabilities of the patient moving to a next state, either healthy or diseased, it's only based on the current state of the patient. This compacts the entire history of the patient so far. And in each stage, or state, we have observations that are representative to that particular state. For instance, in a healthy state, the creatinine levels or the blood pressures of the patient are normal, while in an extremely sick state, the creatinine levels or blood pressure are abnormal. So we have representative observations of the underlying state of the patient. However, a key disadvantage of such Markov models is that they assume that the different stages or states of the disease of the patient are observable. However, this is often not the case. So instead, a more sophisticated formalism would be to model this using hidden Markov models, or for short, HMMs. Unlike Markov models, hidden Markov models are having states that may not necessarily be observed. They are latent or unobserved. And we will need to infer the underlying latent state of the patient on the basis of the observable physiological data that is acquired over time. So for instance, on the basis of a variety of biomarkers acquired over time, such as for instance, creatinine level, we can infer the underlying unobserved state of the patient, which may be the state of the renal disease of the patient. And what you see here is the graphical representation of such a hidden Markov model, which has the hidden state Z on top, which are inferred on the basis of the observational data that is measured over time. However, hidden Markov models have their own disadvantages. One of them is that they assume strict Markovianity. So the time uh, at which the patient finds himself or herself in a particular state does not matter. It is only the state that matters. Also, they assume that the data is regularly sampled and fully observed in every state. And this is often not the case, as we discussed before. Data may be informatively sampled, and there may be states in which we have no observations because the clinician may have not considered it necessary to acquire information in that state. 
Also, they do not learn effectively from the available supervision and information that is available in the clinical notes about the states of the patient. Also, they assume one disease at a time. So usually the patient may have multiple diseases, may have multiple morbidities, they may progress uh, during his or her hospitalization, and they need to be modeled jointly rather than one at a time. Finally, these different models are one size fits all. So for instance, the hidden Markov model here has transition probabilities across different states that are average for the average patient or population level rather than individualized considering the unique characteristics of the patient at hand. So in order to deal with these limitations, a few years back, we developed a comprehensive model to consider all of these challenges. We call this model a hidden absorbing semi-Markov model. And this model um, is able to learn from the observable physiological processes to learn hidden states like in an HMM, but unlike in an HMM, it is not only uh, considering the current state of the patient, but also the duration that the patient has been in a particular state. So by considering the state duration, this model is no longer a Markov model, but rather a semi-Markov model. Also, we are able to learn from the annotated states, which may be observable and possibly absorbing. So let me give here a few examples. So for instance, we are able to learn from observable absorbing states when the patient was, for instance, dying from a particular disease, cardiac disease or cancer-related mortality in the hospital. Or the patient may have a non-absorbing state, but a state that is observable. For instance, the patient may have developed sepsis, but since then they have recovered. So we are able to learn from both observations, but also observable states. Also, we are able to learn progression and progression over time, and not only one disease at a time, but learn across multiple diseases simultaneously, thereby being able to deal with competing risk. Also, we are able to learn from entire episodes, inclusively data that may be rightly censored. So for instance, here a patient may have been discharged and we are able to learn on the basis of such information. Or the patient may have been transferred to another hospital. And again, this information is informative and we are going to be able to learn on the basis of it. Also, we are able to learn from clinician judgments. As we said before, the timing of the observations and not only the value of the observations are informative. The fact that the doctor has ordered a particular x-ray for this patient at this particular moment in time, or has taken a certain amount of blood tests more regularly, may be informative about the underlying state of the patient. And hence our models need to learn from this. Our hidden absorbing semi-Markov model is able to use such a comprehensive model and learn offline at training time in a three-step process. So a first step of this uh, Markov, hidden absorbing semi-Markov models involves change point detection. So we are able to learn on the basis of the available information, inclusively informative missingness, as well as absorbing states, uh, when the patient is moving to a new state. So the change point detection is able to determine, determine when the state of the patient is changing. In a second step, for the states that are annotated by the clinicians, they are observed. For instance, in the, this case, they are annotated with ICD-9 codes, but other type of annotations are also possible. And we are able to learn what is the expected underlying state on the basis of the measurements, but also these annotations. In a third step, for the unobserved states that are not annotated by the clinicians, 
we are performing expectation maximization for this unobserved state, thereby identifying the expected state the patient was in on the basis of only the available observations at that moment in time. After we have learned of that, at training time or test time or run time, we are able to use this model for new patients to issue dynamic forecast. So on the basis of the time series physiological data acquired about the patient so far, we are able to do diagnosis. And diagnosis is nothing else than identifying the underlying state that the patient is in at the current moment in time, as well as prognosis, which is the probability of the patient moving within a certain time window capital T that can be defined by the clinician in the short run or in the long run, what is the probability that they are going to move to a particular state. So in this way, we can determine what is the prognosis for a patient to die in the hospital, to experience a particular event, to be discharged, et cetera, et cetera. The hidden absorbing semi-Markov model is a generalized formalism that um, encapsulates many other formalisms, such as the hidden Markov models, hypothesis testing, et cetera. And it is beneficial to have such a general model because depending on the characteristics of the disease and the patient, we can learn subsets of the model that may represent the unique characteristics of the patient. So can we declare success with this formalism? In many settings, the hidden absorbing Markov model is sufficient. But in some scenarios, the history of the patient matters. So just considering the current state and duration in a state, which the hidden absorbing semi-Markov models assume is not enough. They ignore the history, meaning the previous states the patient has been in and possibly the order of these states, which may be uh, informative about future events of interest. Also, they are one size fits all. And the transition probabilities between the different states are the same across the population thereby ignoring individualized clinical trajectories. So to cope with these limitations, we have developed yet another formalism, which we call attentive state space models. Attentive state space models are a general formalism, which is this time non-stationary rather than Markovian or semi-Markovian. The entire history of the patient so far matters when issuing predictions about the patient being in the future in the new state. And these different transitions among the different states, all of them matter. So not only the transition from the current state to the future, but all the past state realizations and transitions matter. These are the attention weights which we are learning about the patient at every moment in time. And how much these past states have mattered and the transition between them have mattered changes over time. Also, uh, they depend on the unique characteristics of the patient, which include both dynamic information as well as static information, such as information prior to hospitalization, comorbidities, or genetic information that may be available about the patient. The attentive state space model represents a generalization of all the other models that I have presented so far, including hidden absorbing semi-Markov model, hidden Markov model, autoregressive models, or other deep learning models. Using now this type of formalism, we can answer questions such as uh, the ones posed by um, Tom. However, Lucas brought yet a new problem how we can predict whether and when a patient can be safely extubated. This goes beyond a forecasting problem, a dynamic forecasting problem, because it involves understanding what would be the effect of a treatment, mechanical ventilation extubation. This problem can be formalized no longer as a time series analysis and forecasting, but rather because it involves a treatment is a causal inference individualized treatment effect estimation problem. 
Unlike in the forecasting problem, where the focus was on using past history of the patient to issue forecasts, now we need to answer a more complex problem because we need to estimate the effect of possible treatments over time and determining counterfactual outcomes. We need to answer what if questions. What would happen to this patient if at this moment in time or a time in the future, we would apply this or that particular treatment? What would be the effect in terms of the different outcomes of interest? And on the basis of these counterfactual outcomes, we can determine the best outcome and hence the recommendation of a treatment to use. For instance, that the patient can be safely extubated at this current moment in time, or not that he or she will need to be continued to be extubated for a certain amount of time. This, uh, as I mentioned, is a counterfactual estimation problem, an individualized treatment effect problem which can be uh, formalized in this way, but also solved using machine learning models. And for that, we have developed a counterfactual recurrent neural network, which is able to compute such counterfactuals over time using a novel sequence to sequence architecture, which is able to estimate the effect of the different treatments on the patient over time. In this way, we can answer some other questions posed by other clinicians as well such as the question posed by Paul, which is asking about the right dose to be given to the patient at a particular moment in time. However, the challenge of the problem brought by Paul is that unlike in Lucas case, where the focus was on one particular treatment um, and hence ventilation or no ventilation at this current moment in time, dosage is a more complex scenario which involves a decision about a continuous variable rather than a discrete variable, a discrete treatment versus a continuous treatment. So this represents state of the art in machine learning right now. So while the problem can be formalized within the same causal inference and estimation of individualized treatment effects, solutions for the problem brought by Paul are a lot more complex and a lot more research is needed in this particular regard. Let us now take another problem, that of brought by Ari, which talks about the additional predictive benefit by keeping a particular patient in the ICU for another day. This is a causal inference, an estimation treatment effect inference, again, because the point here is to understand what will be the effect of keeping the patient one more day in the ICU. However, in this case, we are having an additional challenge, the challenge of monitoring, since Ari is talking about the benefits of monitoring for this particular patient. And this problem can be formalized as an active sensing and value of information problem. So for the current patient, on the basis of the information that we have so far, we can predict different events of interest. For instance, the probability of the patient dying improving or, for instance, being benefiting from an additional day in the ICU. We estimate in this way the value of monitoring, the value of information for this current patient, thereby understanding what will be the value of acquiring, for instance, a new lab test at this moment in time for the patient in order to be able to issue a more accurate prediction. In this way, we can do a personalized screening and monitoring that is bespoke for the patient at hand. Um, let me consider now another problem brought by Brent, who talks about the optimal frequency of vital sign measurements for the specific patient, which is, again, an active sensing and value of information problem like that brought forward by Ari. He also asks whether for a given patient, the observed vital signs indicate an increased risk. This is again a time series analysis and forecasting problem, which can be formalized and solved in a similar way as discussed previously uh, for the problem brought forward by Tom. And then how we can uh, necessitate or not transferring the patient to a higher level of care which is a causal uh, inference or estimation of individualized treatment effects as brought forward by Lucas. So you see here how the problem brought forward by Brent 
requires multiple parts and multiple formalisms as well as solutions to work together to comprehensive answer this question brought forward by Brent. Let us now look at another problem that brought forward by Vishnu, who talks about the collective physiological burner for a cohort of patients uh, and modeling the mismatch between the collective burner and the healthcare resources available at that moment in time. Modeling the physiological burden for a patient can be done using time series forecasting. And we can do that for both one patient as well as group of patients uh, taken at a time at the moment, at the current moment in time in the hospital. So this can be formalized in the same way as I mentioned up previously. However, the challenge brought forward now by Vishnu is how to model the mismatch between the available resources and the needs for resources for the current patients. For this, we need to use and formalize this problem using operations research. So we have here, for instance, patients arriving. These are the customers highlighted here, which are arriving to the hospital. And they may be waiting either in the waiting room or maybe they are already hospitalized and they are waiting for admission to a specific type of service. For instance, um, they may need ventilators or admission to the ICU. And hence, what you see here is that these patients are waiting in the queue, thereby there is a delay associating with the queuing time. And depending on the queuing discipline, uh, which may be um, highest priority or first come first served or sickest patient first, they are going to be giving access to the service. The service may be access to a particular scan or imaging device, access to an ICU or a ventilator, or access to a particular type of clinician. And after they have been provided this service, the patient are exiting that particular facility. So in this case, machine learning and operations research need to work together to learn how to uh, map effectively the resources available, the clinical resources available, to the needs of the patients over time. So the needs of the patients over time are modeled using uh, the general dynamic forecasting model that I presented previously, where there is a hidden absorbing semi-Markov model or an attentive state space model. But then this information is um, used to determine queuing discipline and determining who should have access to the service and when and what will be the burden associated with this use of resources. So in this way, machine learning and operations research need to work together to effectively model and solve the problem brought forward by Vishnu. OK, so before we move into the Q&A session, um, I'd just like to introduce the Hub for Healthcare, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a project uh, recently started by our lab that aims to tie together a lot of this approach of addressing problems and questions through formalisms and to do so via our website, as you'll see in a minute. I have discussed so far a few ways in which we can formalize and solve the challenge is brought forward by a few acute care clinicians. These and many more can be found in the hub for healthcare, which we have developed and which Nick will present subsequently. So the purpose of our lab's hub for healthcare is to show how we can match many different problems raised by clinicians with formalisms and solutions that use approaches from machine learning, AI and operations research. The page is currently in its early stages, both in terms of development and in terms of population with problems. We hope to add more content as we increase the scope and depth of our engagement with the clinical community. And we'll also be adapting and improving the page itself based on the feedback we receive to become as useful as possible over time. There are two main ways you can use the Hub for Healthcare. One is to browse the page freely, discovering the kinds of problems that have been raised by clinicians and seeing how these problems can be matched with formalisms and solutions. The other is to search for specific domains within medicine. These are pretty much currently limited to acute care. Or specific types of medical problems, such as early warning systems. 
or specific formulisms such as prediction. You can also search for keywords, for example, dosing. In the Hub for Healthcare, we've color coded the parts of the problems that correspond clearly to the formalisms we introduce. This is done in order to explicitly show the connections between the problems and the formalisms. We've also used the same colors to refer to papers in which these formalisms are put into practice, thereby establishing a chain all the way from problem to solution via formalism. As I mentioned, the Hub for Healthcare will continue to grow over time, and we'd appreciate any feedback or thoughts you have. Now I'll hand back to Mihaila, who will explain how we plan to grow projects like the Hub for Healthcare alongside our engagement sessions, as well as our development of background materials. So what's next? Nick has introduced our Hub for Healthcare, which contains the various problems brought forward by the acute care clinicians and the associated formalisms and solutions. In subsequent weeks, we are going to make available background material with more information about time series analysis and dynamic forecasting, formalisms and solutions, as well as that for causal inference and estimating individualized treatment effects. Subsequent engagement sessions are also going to focus on what data is needed to be able to solve these problems as well as how to evaluate the performance of the various solutions and how to integrate them in the clinical flow, thereby making them truly useful for you, the clinicians. But first, in the next couple of sessions, we plan to first look at a few other clinical domains beyond acute care. The focus behind those will be to identify what is common to the acute care setting but also what are differences in these different clinical domains. In this way, we can identify canonical formalisms and solutions that may transcend a particular clinical domain and may be generally useful, as well as what are unique characteristics of a particular clinical domain, which may need their unique formalisms and solutions. We also want to ask you to provide us in the meantime feedback. We would like for every clinical category to bring forward new problems that we can incorporate in our hub for healthcare, as well as give us feedback about the background material, formalisms and solutions that we are providing, such that this is truly useful for you. Also, we would like to know your feedback about this particular uh, hub, as well as the engagement sessions, and how we can make them more useful for you, the clinical community, and in this way also enable us to interact more closely and more effectively with you, such that we can empower you using technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and operations research, and can co-develop together with you these various solutions. Please let us know. All right, so now it's time for our Q&A session. Um, so we will call on a number of you to unmute yourself to ask your questions. And we already thankfully have a lot of uh, questions already lined up. Um, so when we ask you to uh, speak, please identify yourself and then try to keep your question within one minute, if at all possible, because we'd like to get uh, around to as many of these as possible, um, given the limited amount of time we have. And then please remute yourself uh, once we've finished with your question uh, so we don't continue to hear you throughout the Q&A. So I think our first question is coming from uh, Huda. And Huda, I think you actually had two questions. Would you mind just for, at this point asking the first of the two for us? Yes, sure. Um, so my name is Huda. I'm a general practitioner. And uh, my question was about missing data. So the data uh, that usually is not collected is not collected for a reason. And my question was, should we then consider that there's no missing at random um, in this situation? So thank you very much, Huda, for and everyone else for joining us today. So this is an excellent question. So indeed, uh, we would like 
to learn on the basis of missing data, inclusively data not missing at random. Clearly, these models should learn from the judgment of clinicians, including when they decide to acquire particular information and for whom. So um, in some of the formalism that we have posted in the Hub for Healthcare, we are discussing data not missing at random and the value from learning in, in that. But this is also related um, to another issue, that of personalized monitoring for a specific patient. So on one hand is, how do we learn on the basis of data, inclusively data that is not missing at random? And indeed, we should be able to learn from that such that we effectively learn rather than just impute. But then related to this question is that of personalized monitoring and value of information going forward. So we may be able to learn what information will be most valuable to collect for this particular patient, given the potential risks for this patient in the short run and in the long run. This could be provided as decision support for clinicians. So uh, it is not only about learning from the past, but also potentially for monitoring in the future. So hopefully how that this answers your question. Great, okay. Um, so I think next up we have Liz. And Liz, um, I think you sort of raised a comment relatively early on that sort of precipitated a mini discussion, but if you wouldn't mind just uh, bringing us back to that comment um, for Mihaela to discuss as well. Yeah, thanks. My name's Liz Anger. I'm the Clinical Director of Primary Care at West Hans CCG, that's in Wessex in the UK. Um, I think the first thing I raised was just about, this is great that it's acute care, but would it be helpful to get some of this work into primary care as well on that prediction pathway? Because if you see they're deteriorating, get that early, then it's less of a problem them coming in more sick basically. So it's something about getting that joined up along the patient pathway. So thank you very much Liz for this comment, which I think it's very important. So often um, it is Im very important to learn what information is useful for a particular decision, whether it's admitting the patient to the hospital or how do we treat them after they were admitted. And it is not always that the more information, the better, or that we need this information for everyone. So I think that if the sources of information are available and we can join indeed data in the hospital to the data beforehand, either data from the electronic health record of the patient uh, or data that was acquired uh, by a general practitioner before he was admitted to the hospital or even data from NHS 111, for instance, understanding how this data may be valuable to inform decisions in the short run as the patient is just admitted or even within the entire journey and for what type of risks this information will be informative is something that machine learning can assist with. So I think that an important piece of the puzzle here is learning the value again and value of information for subclasses of patients and for subclasses of decisions. So this is also related to one of the engagement sessions we plan to do in a few months time, where we are discussing how we can use available data to determine what data is relevant, when, for what classes of patients, and how much it would contribute on top of other data that may be available already, such that we can decide when to collect this information and when this is not necessary because it adds additional burden for the patient and the clinician. Hopefully this Liz answered your question. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have about time for three more questions. Um, so the next one's kind of a combination question um, on a similar topic, uh, first raised by Tom Daniels and then by Huda. Huda actually had to drop off uh, just a minute ago. So I think we'll just take Tom's question on this. Um, please go ahead, Tom. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Mahela. Um, I was just interested in the states that you describe, um, which as a clinician, I, I don't really recognize those states as such. I see patients more on a continuum um, of a particular condition 
how much of a pulmonary exacerbation, how much, how bad is their sepsis rather than sepsis or not sepsis. Um, and I wondered if you could describe uh, whether the states that you, you put them in, uh, in these models, um, and uh, as whether they, um, whether they maintain their validity when as a clinician, we, we see it more as a continuum, or whether it's um, uh, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, in that as long as the models are predictive, um, that uh, it doesn't matter if uh, it doesn't quite fit with uh, our clinical practice on the ground. So thank you so much, Tom. This is such a fantastic question. So I think that on one hand, this is part of the journey of trying to make um, clinical care a lot more quantifiable. So coming up with states that are recognizable and actionable, and they can be easily communicated across clinicians such that they can make systematic decisions is part of the, of, the, of, of the purpose here. So not only predictability, but also understanding. So that being said, I think in many longitudinal settings, whether it's renal, renal failure or even cystic fibrosis, your specialty, clearly we are talking often about stages or states of disease progression where the patient is moving from um, maybe um, a healthy state towards an acute state. But of course, in the short-term patient monitoring in the ICU, it is true that the patient state is continuous. And this is expressed to some extent in our model as the risk, the probability of being absorbed in a particular state of interest. So you can view it in that way. And a state, if you like, it's more like a categorization or a clustering of multiple biomarkers that are associated with this individual discrete state. And it can be used, for instance, for prompting actionability, such that you can say only when the patient is in this particular state, we decide to intubate them or transfer them to the ICU or give them antibiotic. So it is easier to make decisions rigorously and communicate policies and prescribe policies across clinicians by categorizing patients in these discrete states. Um, but the biomarkers associated with it are, if you like, continuous. This is also to some extent what scores like MUSE or NUSE or Apache do. But the difference here is that we have an entire state trajectory and a state evolution. So hopefully that, that answers your question. And, and related to, to also Huda's related question, yes, we would like ideally to make these states being actionable. And clear, clinically meaningful. Okay, um, so I think our penultimate question is from Brent, uh, who like Tom was uh, one of the clinicians kind enough to join us. Um, Hi guys, um, yeah, great. Thank you for taking my question. So my question had to do with the causal inference problem formulation. And I noticed that a lot of times in the way that these problems are formulated, they make the assumption of unconfoundedness. And, you know, for clinical researchers, you know, we're always believe there's other unmeasured confounding. And, you know, I think in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we get around this assumption or how do we justify it? And are there other methods like instrumental variables or ways that we can incorporate other techniques to uh, get more unbiased estimates. So thank you, Brent. This is, if you like, uh, the cutting edge, not only of medicine, but of machine learning. So I think that this is why as a machine learner is very interesting, besides the soci societal impact, to engage with you, because this is how uh, you are pushing us forward as a community in machine learning. So this actually represents the cutting edge frontier in machine learning. Um, dealing with confounders um, and hidden confounder is challenging for machine learning. But very recently uh, in our lab, we have made great progress in this regard. And it is especially easier to do in two settings. One is exactly the acute care setting because that's a time series setting. And the fact that we observe data and the data is available over time, it is these observations over time that help us deal with a lot of the confounders. And, um, but going into the details would require a little bit longer conversation. So we may post maybe some materials about that. 
Another setting where we can deal with these hidden confounders is settings where across multiple hospitals, potentially in different types of setting or in different types of countries. So especially in the time series setting and the setting where we have multiple locations um, is when recent progress has been made in identifying, estimating treatment effects and causal inference, even under presence of hidden confounders. So, so thank you for that. Okay, and I think our final question is um, actually from Lucas. It looks to me like Lucas may have actually uh, dropped off the chat, but I can read out his question, uh, which was the states that patients are in may sometimes not be states that clinicians recognize as a distinct or important clinical state. May we use these models to identify states that are clinically relevant, stable, or frequent? So the, the whole idea here would be that these states do correspond to clinically meaningful states. And again, the focus will be to learn on the basis of the available data progression. How many states, for instance, is a particular patient having a particular comorbidity and being admitted to the hospital for a particular disease passed through? So even learning the number of states, as well as the transitions between the states across different subpopulations of patients that are um, hospitalized is part of what machine learning can help do, such that we understand differences between patients. So it could be that, again, different classes and subclasses of patients have different number of states, state transitions. And also some of this may be already recognizable by clinicians and we can link them with the clinician notes such that they can be annotated by the terms and language provided in the narratives of the clinicians seeing these patients. But now the advantage is that we can go one step further and have very quantitative, rigorous formalisms associated with different states, such that we know what is the probability of seeing certain biomarkers in these states, as well as transiting to a next state, which will be um, represented by different types of biomarkers and where the probability of adverse events, inclusively mortality, may change as opposed to a previous state. More about this can be found actually in the materials that we are trying to provide together to the Hub for Healthcare, but subsequent engagement sessions, maybe we can go into more details into this. Okay, um, so I think that pretty much wraps up the Q&A session and we're just a couple minutes behind schedule. So I'll try and whiz through the housekeeping uh, at the very end relatively quickly. So our next session will be on January 28th at the same time as this session, which is 4 p.m. UK time. Our focus this time will be on cancer, which is the sort of the, the lens through which we see this approach again of matching problems and questions to formalisms and then to solutions. So we'll have a relatively similar format, but hopefully a longer Q&A session next time round. Um, so in the meantime, uh, we'd actually like to hear your thoughts on how we can make these sessions as useful as possible and improve them, as well as, for example, um, the Hub for Healthcare. Um, so if you want to give any feedback on the Hub itself or maybe propose some questions or problems that we can add to the Hub, uh, we'll be sending out a form in the next couple of days uh, for you to do this. And in the meantime, um, we'd really appreciate it if you continue to let friends or colleagues know about these sessions, you can do so using the URL on this slide here. And other than that, I'd like to thank all of you who've joined us for today's session and those of you who have asked questions or contributed to the discussion that was kind of ongoing in the chat throughout the session, which was great. Um, and also especially to the acute care clinicians uh, who gave up some of their time to join us um, in advance of this session and provide their own problems and questions to help structure our thinking around this. And especially given everything that's going on in their particular domain right now, we very, very much appreciate that. Uh, other than that, I would say, uh, please take care, stay safe and see you in 2021. Thank you very much.